Is your small business growing? That's the question we address right here on the Grow Your Biz Show. It's where we interview strategic entrepreneurs who inform and inspire you on your solopreneur or small company journey. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the Grow Your Biz Show. Hello and welcome to the Grow Your Biz Show. I'm your host, Paul Madsen, and this is episode number 116, 116 of the show, and I have a very special guest with me today. Uh, his name, how you doing, Robert? Robert Hilkeman. Hi there, how you doing, Paul? Robert, uh, great, thank you, thank you. Thanks for joining us today on the very first Zoom show of the Grow Your Biz show. Well, uh, Robert Hilkeman, of course, is a, a, a state senator from District 4, which is come mostly uh, West Omaha. Uh, Robert, how long have you been a senator down in Lincoln? Well, I, I'm, in my, I'm in my sixth session right now. I've, okay. uh, this is uh, my second term, and of course we're term limited, so I have two more years after this. No, so you're, you're about done then, on your downhill side, huh? We're on the downhill side, right? Sure, well, uh, that's too bad for the people of Nebraska, well, <laughs> in my opinion. You know, I have to say that I was one of those persons who voted for term limits when I did so, and now that I'm a part of it, it was not a smart vote. Oh, so, really? Well, I mean, it's like anything else, isn't it? You, want, you, you get better at it as you go along. Yeah, you know, the, the, the people have no idea what the learning curve is. Oh, uh, I can't imagine. On, on jobs like that. And, and uh, you just, you sort of start to know who you can trust and get really familiar with the issues. And you've gone through it enough times. And we're basically going to be uh, going out the door. So, uh, yeah, that's too bad. <laughs> it, it, you know, we, uh, as I, you know, I used to think that it was a really good thing, but I'm not in favor of term limits anymore. And the fact of the sense that we have term limits, and that's called the voting box. And if you have people that are not doing their jobs, vote them out. Uh, yeah, right, exactly. Well, I, I think that's you have people that are willing and able to do the job and show a penchant that they're good. Why get rid of the good people? Um, the reason uh, viewers uh, know from the, on the show here that we focus on entrepreneurs and startups and running a small business and uh, people say, Paul, why do you have uh, Robert Hilkeman as a state senator on? He's not a businessman. And what they don't know is, uh, if they ask that question, is that uh, how long did you have your own business? I was a, I practiced podiatry for thirty nine years, Paul. Thirty nine years. Thirty nine years. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, uh, Robert. What, uh, first you you started as a teacher, didn't you? Is that right? I did. I started off as a teacher for three years, and then I went to podiatry school and did my residency. And I started the Foot and Ankle Center at the, in July of uh, nineteen seventy seven, and I practiced up through December of twenty thirteen. Wow. I, well, that's and, a, you know, it's interesting when we talk about entrepreneurship uh, and small. It, I really think being to, in order to get elected, you almost have to be an entrepreneur to do that as well. So there's well, not I, a lot of correlation between running a small business, getting elected. And then once you're there in the legislature, I, did, I think you need to be you, the, the same things that made you successful as an entrepreneur will make you successful as a senator. Well, I could totally see that with uh, I mean, networking and the building relationships and having uh, the, um, the wherewithal to go deeper and ask questions and probe and not take things at face value. I mean, there are all sorts of entrepreneurial skills would be required. I never really thought about that. I, I especially see the, the to get elected part because I remember some of your election, you were a, you were a genuine startup. <laughs> I mean, well, you were I, a I had never been in politics. And so right, um, right. Uh, we just had to start off from door, from knocking on the doors and letting people know. But, but a lot of the principles that I used in my practice are what I used in my, in, in, in the election as well. So. That's right. Well, and so again, people with 39 years, remember that's a business. Level. It's not just, uh, you had your own business. You weren't employed by a hospital or anything like that. You, uh, had how many employees at your peak? Oh, probably 12 or 14. It's Holy like cow. Yeah. And so, I mean, you know, all the pitfalls and challenges of starting yeah. a business, running a business, meeting the payroll and, and all those things. So I think you speak from a, speak from a lot of uh, experience on that. That's terrific. Yeah. 39 years. <laughs> that's a, that's a pretty good number. That's, that's terrific. Well, and I, I, I think I have an end. You just before we move on the whole idea of, um, of, uh, 
how you talk about entrepreneurial to get elected. Uh, tell folks how, how many doors you knocked on and how many thank you notes you wrote and all that. I mean, you oh. talk about customer acquisition in the entrepreneur business. Well, you're acquiring a vote, right? You said you're and tell us about how you did that. Yeah, well, the the the, uh, the, the big deal is is uh, you you have to know your you have to know your subject. You have to, in other words, you have to it's your knowledge that you have of the job. That's the important thing. It's raising money, it's making people aware, and it's your image. Those are the things that you need to really focus on. And you need to, and not one is necessarily more important than the other, but you know, you need to, you need to know what your message is. And, and uh, you only get that by learning what, what, what are the needs of the people? What's the, and so, and you find that out by knocking on their doors and asking them that questions. And you need to go out and raise money. And we were able to go to a lot of, people that we knew and, and lots of friends helped out raise money because without money, you just can't get, you don't, you can't get the good flyers. You can't get the mailers that are out there and so forth. Right. And then your image, you, you, it's so important. Your image is a very important factor of it and your, and, and, and your message that you're, that you're indicating. And so I was, I had a, a good mentor in that area that yeah. I, I listened to that mentor. And that's really where we that's really where we focused on this. And at some points, I was trying to kind of push my campaign. I got to get out. And I got to get meeting people and so forth. He said, "You're not ready. You're not ready because you oh. don't have your message yeah. down well enough. You don't. You know, you're in, and, you need, and he said, because once you once you misstate things or you say things wrong, oh. that's 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 out there." You only get one chance to make a first impression, right? You only get one chance to make a good first impression. And yeah. So, anyway, so that was an important fact of it. And as with any kind of business, or anything else, it's it's a lot of hard work, Paul. And every day, and I had a wonderful helpmate in it. In my wife, we went yeah. around, and, and uh, she'd go on one side of the street, and I was on the other, and we would meet at the end of the <laughs> street, go to the next street, and just go right on down. We. We literally walked through our district two and a half times in the, in, in the first election. That's and a lot of shoe leather. <laughs> that's a lot of shoe leather, lots of knocking. And, and you know, people, for the most part, were really receptive. One of the things that I, that I took from my practice, Paul, I used to, when people came in as new patients into my office, I would take time and I'd just write them a little note. Dear Paul, thanks for coming in, uh, coming into the office today. Uh, uh, I look forward to taking care of your problem, whatever you know, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And if you have any questions, give me a call. It was I always handwritten note. Well, I did the same thing. My wife. So when we would have people that, but if they came to the door and they talked with me, did more than just take my flyer, uh, I would say, Dear Paul, it was nice to. Thanks for coming to the door tonight. It was good to visit with you about. Uh, the property taxes or whatever the issue was that they had, I'd make a little note on my You had to take notes, yeah. And, yeah. And, and so it was very typical. We'd come home. We, we'd start about 5 o'clock in the night to do our, our door knocking from 5 until 8. Yeah. We'd come home and we'd write notes and we'd stop over at the Boys Town Post Office and drop about 30 or 40 thank you notes in for the night before. Wow. Go out, do the same ah. So they got it like the day or two after, right? That's right. And, oh, that's and, great. And, well, you know, it's total entrepreneurship. Yeah. Totally. Because, I mean, as an entrepreneur, and you know this from starting your practice, the the you have to have that message. Uh, and, uh, I mean, I, I talk to a lot of people who want to start their own business or even have started their own business, and sometimes they cannot articulate exactly what makes them different in, in just one sentence. And I really think that's important. Because today we have Twitter and everything else and Snapchat and all, you name it and Facebook and so on. And, and there's so much information that you only get about five or six or seven seconds, don't you? That's, that's about right. Yeah. And so did, what, was your, uh, what was your message as a, as a uh, candidate for office and, uh, and going way back uh, when yep. you were acquiring yep. new My patients way back when? People come to our door, and I said, "I'm Robert Hilcom, and I'm running for the for the legislature. I'm a lifelong Nebraskan. I was a teacher. I was I retired from my medical practice. I now want to take the opportunity to serve you in the legislature and and use my years of experience to serve you." 
Have a seat. Oh, you're done in uh, you're done in twelve seconds. It, well, it's 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 that elevator speech that you have. Absolutely, to I finally have mine down to to um, let's see if I can do it by heart. <laughs> um, GrowMedia.com builds your social media engagement via short strategic videos. What I uh, what I do when I to monetize my work outside of this TV show, and um, I like it because it says what I do and and it says who it's for, and you know it's for that small business person. Because so many times, oh, I got to be on social media. What do I do? I got to be on social media, and they don't know what to put on it, and they don't know how often to put it on or what to put on. And uh, a project I just completed with one client was uh, created eight testimonial videos of his customers. And he's going to put those on on a series of each week coming forward. And it's just fun. I'm not here to talk about me. I, I just want to emphasize the, how important it is for people to have their message in one sentence. So what did you do when you started your practice, when you were looking for uh, new patients? I'm sure there are other podiatrists established in the community. And how did you uh, compete with that? How did you yeah. articulate well, that? The, the real thing that you need to do is you need to let people know that you're aware and you also need to know your customers. And, and, and uh, for me, we're, my practice grew because I would get referrals from not only other podiatrists, but also from, from general physicians. And so it was oh, important yeah. for me to go out and meet the different physicians and to let them know what I did. And uh, so I was, I was always making phone calls phone calls, writing notes, uh, letting them know that I'd seen, even if I, even if they hadn't referred me to you, I would oftentimes send them a note and say, you know, I saw your patient, Paul, and uh, he's he right. dealing with a, with a heel pain or whatever else it would be, and, and uh, just wanted to make you aware that, he, that, that he's under my care for this, that type of thing. Just that would get my name out. And you so, wrote a lot of personal notes then, too? Lots of personal notes. <laughs> lots yeah. of personal notes. You know, you know, the power of saying thank you is so important. Because nobody does. Yeah, nobody does anymore. I mean, I, it just seems like I, I, I really agree with that, Paul. And, and, and I think one of the things we, we had with, with email and, and all of our social media now is, is that people say, well, I sent you an email. There's still nothing like getting a note written, handwritten note, comes in the, in the letter, it just sets you apart from from the person who said thanks for seeing or whatever else on the email. I know that's it's simpler, it's less expensive, and all that sort of thing. But you got the time. The, the personal touch really makes a big difference. Well, absolutely, and it just said, uh, you know, I get that note, and I, it says to me, uh, "Hey, Robert cared enough to take I don't know two or three minutes is probably all it really took, but two or three minutes to to." to do this he he, he licked a stamp he wrote an address on a card and, right. and and look at this i got something in the mail it's tangible i mean things when you talk about you know developing your own business and forth it's so important to have people around you who also are like-minded and, and have that whole comment of, be, of being service oriented and focusing on on the patient or the customer and i was i was very fortunate i i uh I tried to keep my staff members very happy and keep them. Uh, uh, I, I uh, oftentimes I know in comparison to a lot of my colleagues who say, you know, you, you don't want to keep your staff too long because you don't want to start paying big salaries for them. I was just the opposite. Wow. I had, I had, I had some of my, I had one of my employees that was with me almost the entire time that I was in practice. Wow. <laughs> Well, it's and it's it's got all, a family with you. I know, knowing you, it's uh, it was a family, right? And 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 it was important to me, and I'm so proud, pleased that that when those people ended their employment with me, they had a retirement fund that they could draw upon. That you know that they'll have they'll have a a fairly they should have a, a halfway decent retirement that coming up there and that's terrific and that's unusual for uh, small small companies yeah. and small employers to to yeah. do that but uh thing for me it, it doesn't surprise me uh, knowing you again as well so that that's terrific what uh, uh you know in this day and age it's a difficult uh startup uh right now started a new business uh i mean terribly with the virus uh going on and some you and i were chatting that some businesses aren't going to make it and maybe it's not the best time to start 
well, business on the other hand, maybe there's good time to start other businesses like some kind of online education or who knows what. But anyway, um, along the way with your 39 years, I mean, I'm sure you had some speed bumps and roadblocks and whatnot. Could you share maybe a short version of one of those and, and how you as an entrepreneur overcame it? Well, I think probably um, uh, but, but one of the things that, that uh, you, bring, you bring other professionals into your practice and uh, <laughs> that was probably the most difficult thing for me because I always wanted to bring in a person who had, I like to use the, the illustration of the Russian doll. I like to have people that have you, you, you have about three or four dolls that they stick together. And there's one. Right, right. I always wanted to have someone who came in who had skills that I didn't have or had was a bigger person than myself. And I wanted them to, to branch out from that. Right. And uh, over the years, I'd have some, I brought some people in that, that, that had those skills really grasp it. And they were wonderful, wonderful partners. But then I had some that you would bring in and then, they they tended not to uh, uh, you, you, they they weren't into the service aspect that you were there. Uh, for right. me, availability was such a big uh, uh, deal. I always had the philosophy in my office: there's always room for one more. And when people would call in and they needed to get in, we always found a way to get them involved in it. I had right. Saturday hours. I would go later if I had to in the day. Right. And for me, I was always I always wanted to be available. Right. Well, sometimes you get some of the practitioners that that you know that that's not their style anymore. That they, they want to you know they they feel that that uh, yeah. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna work from nine to three or whatever else. Yeah. Whatever. And so that was always a struggle for me to find people that had the kind of commitment, the work commitment that that uh, that I used to like to put in. And sure. That was, that was you gotta a, get that ownership uh, mentality in there, and it's not always easy to do when you're hiring employees. But you know, and that that is uh, when one starts to duplicate themselves in a small business. I mean, I work with a lot of individual one one off, you know, solopreneur types. And when they make that next step to uh, getting that next person, that's a really big jump sometimes because, it, like you say, it can affect everything. Right. Got to be the cultural fit, right? Yes. And, and, and if you either get people that have that kind of uh, that mentality that, you know, the word. Uh, so the, the, the biggest challenge for me was not necessarily finding the employees that were the, you know, the, that did a lot of the, the basic work. But professionally, I said that was my biggest struggle was getting people that I could count on that were going to be there. And, yeah. and uh, uh, but with the periods of time when we had good people to work with, it made a huge difference for us. So yeah, well, we could probably spend a, a three-hour webinar on how to hire good people and how not to hire bad people, and and still not cover it all. And so we 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 better move on. But uh, yeah, okay. suffice it to say, I'm sure that. Uh, Adding adding the right people and determining who those right people are is a uh, is a real key, especially for a small business that's just yeah. duplicating itself for the first time. I, I, I was, I've seen a, a very successful business once, and they 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 had the the Omaha market figured out, and they said, "Well, we know us, so let's let's go do this in another city." And it just fell completely flat in the other city because. Well, for a lot of reasons, but anyway, so it's it's a big step for small business, and yeah. uh, as entrepreneurs out there, listen to Robert and consider that step very wisely. Let's veer, uh, let's do a pivot here and talk about uh, Nebraska and Nebraska for business. Uh, you have a very unique perspective to bring uh, to that as a former entrepreneur and uh, someone who is now on the inside of the unicameral, of course. So, uh, but tell us about small business in Nebraska and. Uh, What's good about small business in Nebraska? What challenges Nebraska has for small business? And remember, we only have about four hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, we certainly have our challenges, uh, uh, and we're we're going to have more now. With this is uh, certainly going to uh, devastate our state as far as the resources that we have, as far as the state is concerned. But uh, you know, we have we have. 
Nebraska Advantage Act has been around now for, since the mid 70s. And uh, so that we have, that allows companies that are trying to hire people to come into the state uh, that, that, or add employees that they can, that the state will help offset some of those costs and we'll give them, there's grants that are available for there. We also have some, even out of that whole same program, young, young entrepreneurs that have an idea can present those ideas to the, to the, to the Department of Labor. And we do have some resources that are available for those, uh, for those different uh, uh, programs that, that they qualify. And, and each program has different uh, changes in qualification. But, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the strength of Nebraska, I think the reason to, 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 for, is, is that is, I think one of our biggest strengths is our people. We have right. good people. We have people with good work ethics, with, with good, uh, 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 we have one of the, we did have one of the lowest uh, unemployment rates in the entire yeah. and, It'll probably uh, still be one of the lower rates, I think. Uh, well, that's you know, true. Compared to others, I mean, some of these, I just, uh, you know, you think of the big, big, big cities and, and the, the thousands of restaurants that they have that just aren't coming back. And I mean, we're, we're you know, we, we have our share here in Omaha too, but you know, I, we were low before, so hopefully we'll be relatively comparatively low again in unemployment. Right. I think we'll get, you know, and, and I've come, Paul, working with the different people that I have and I, I see people come through that take state offices or, 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 directorships and so forth I there's a there's a uh, there's a Nebraska mentality uh, that, that that some people have and some people don't ever get it yeah. and, and 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 part of it is is that I, I think we can sort of smell a rat from a mile away and <laughs> we have some people that 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 uh, from almost from the get-go you just say this guy's not going to make it in Nebraska, and oh. and uh, I I'll, I'll use an illustration of someone that I the very first time I saw this person was uh, Bill Callahan when he came to go take over at Nebraska as the football coach. Oh. I went to that first spring game that he had here, and uh, he was supposed to come out and do the drug pledge for the for the uh, uh, for, for the students that they do at halftime and so forth. And he came out. And, he came, he didn't, here he had 75,000 people sweltering in a 95 degree heat in, in May. And, and he didn't even say, Nebraska, I love you. I'm so excited to be here. And this is going to be great. He just got wow. up and read that pledge. And I said to my friend, I was with the team, I said, this guy isn't going to make it. <laughs> you said, knew right away. I, I, I'm pouring with sweat and he can't even tell you. I'm so proud to be here and be part of this and looking wow. forward to it. Yeah. So, so there's something about crazy. Uh, so when I meet some of these new directors that come in, that that uh, I always say to them, you know, there's some Nebraska mentality, and you need to pick it up. Yeah. And if you're going to be successful here, and I think that is that we're that I think Nebraskans are kind to one another. We visit uh, one, uh, we we respect one another for who they are, and uh, I think some people pick that up and others don't. And if you don't have that uh, spirit. No, yeah. You're gonna have a hard time making it. Yeah, well, I think that you know again we're talking about fit because if you're you're here to serve, I mean, all businesses in some respect, some way or another, you have to serve a customer in some way, shape, or form. And if you, and I mean, it would have been pretty easy for Callahan to just say, you know, hey, happy to be here. Just Absolutely. the, the, the standard sports great. cliche in all movies and all interviews. Uh, I'm just happy to be here, and, and he couldn't pull that off. So That's I think right. you have to be more customer centered. Hey, yep. real quickly, uh, the Department of Labor then has has a ver variety of programs to there are, there are for uh, small business. Available. Uh huh. Oh. Well, and, I'm uh, not sure what all of them are, but I know that they're available there for different for. Okay. Different, uh, and, for different, right. and tell me more again about the Nebraska Advantage Act. What is that like? The Nebraska Advantage Act. That's for the. That's where that came about when uh, we had uh, Con Agra was considering leaving Omaha and and. Uh, the, the, the union, but there was a, in, in the mid '80s when we had this uh, 
dire projection of number, Omaha was basically going right. to close up, you know, and, and it <laughs> set up that, you know, we needed it. So there were a number of tax advantages that were given right. at that time. Right. People. And so we now, it's now called the Nebraska, it has sure. uh, now called the Nebraska Advantage Act. In fact, it, the, the, the act comes to an end this year and we're right, we're, we're in suspension right now, but that's one of the areas that we need to, uh, I hope that we get back to get approved because we don't. We want to continue to keep this, keeping uh, Nebraska a place for people to grow. And, and uh, uh, Nebraska's had a, had a good history. The, the governor's done a good job of, of uh, pushing business for Nebraska. And uh, so, uh, uh, but challenging sure. times we have in the state, uh, particularly the agriculture industry right sure. now. Yeah. Well, to wrap that section up, uh, what, where's the best place for me to start if I'm a fledgling entrepreneur and want to do something, want to see what uh, resources the state of Nebraska has, has for me to, to get going on things? I, well, I would simply contact the Department of Labor. Okay. Yeah, they've got all sorts of things going. I know on a local level in, in Omaha, there's venture, venture funds. There's just all sorts of different things. Well, Too many yeah. to list right now, but uh, so, you know, there's just a bunch of things out there, and I would encourage people to take advantage of them because right. they can loans, uh, low credit loans, all sorts right. of good stuff that can help you get started, right? Exactly. Okay, cool. Hey, well, it's time to wrap up here, uh, Robert. Uh, what, uh, what parting piece of advice would you uh, would you have for uh, the entrepreneurs, the, the wannabe launchers, uh, the the person who has launched and trying to hang in there? What what's what's your well, words of wisdom today? You mentioned right, the, your your whole thing hanging in there, and just realize that that uh, when you're when you're trying to be an entrepreneur and you're trying to get that business started, that if you're good to people and you're and the service that you provide is a is a is a valuable service. You're gonna make it. I think you. I, I really believe it. And well, it, you know, and uh, uh, so I think it's the old Zig Ziglar. If if you if uh, you help enough people get what they want, you'll get the things that you want in life. Exactly. And that's really, I think that that's part of the whole thing of uh, being a good entrepreneur. And I'm gonna wrap up what you just said by with a quote from Thomas Edison. Here's my quote. It says uh, his quote: "The most certain way to succeed." is always just to try one more time. So that's right. I think that's what you just told us. Um, impressive with your 39 year, you couldn't make it to 40, huh, in the podiatry? Yeah, I, 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 would, I would have I loved to, but then I had to run for that election. I so, know, yeah, I gotta, gotta show up down there in Lincoln, right? That's so, great. Yeah, hey, that's thanks so much for your, uh, your time with us today. Good luck in the uh, rest of your uh, service at the Unicameral, and, and we'll, we'll see, you, see you all, see you around. All right, good enough, thanks. Take care, Robert. Very best, you got it.